Well, good morning, church. You know, it's always uh, such a pleasure uh, to be able to bring uh, the Word of God. And, uh, and man, I'm, I'm just excited. I'm excited to be here. But, but I'll tell you what, I don't know about you, but I had quite an eventful week. Um, something serious came up. And so therefore, I had to take some time off work. And if you're wondering what the serious situation was, well, I'll tell you, I had a man flu. Oh, come on. I had a man flu. And if you know anything about a man flu, then you will know it's serious. You know, it's serious. Every man can empathize with me when I say that it's serious. I mean, I, uh, I found that I couldn't contribute in my daily activities in the week. Yeah, I couldn't contribute. I couldn't contribute to doing dishes. I couldn't contribute to doing the laundry or folding the laundry. I, I, couldn't, I, I couldn't do, I couldn't vacuum the house, you know? Things that, yeah, that I'd normally want to do. <laughs> man, this thing's de- debilitating sometimes, you know what I mean? But man, I'm, I'm thankful that I'm alive. I survived. I'm well and I'm good and I'm here. I'm here. <laughs> there must be a reason for that. <laughs> but hey, I, I hope that, that you and your families are, are keeping well, especially uh, in these winter months where, where bugs and sicknesses are going around. My prayer that God will keep you guys healthy. Amen? Amen. All good. Well, we're going to jump straight into the message this morning. So if you've got your Bible or electronic device on you, then I want you to go with me to 1 Samuel verse 1. That's Samuel chapter 1, verse 1 to 20. 1 Samuel chapter 1, verse 1 to 20. If you want to highlight that, then I also want you to highlight chapter 2. So that's 1 Samuel chapter 2, verse 1 to 11. Now these verses are going to set the scene for us today as we delve into a word that God has been stirring up in my spirit. Are you ready? Come on, let's go. Let's go. This morning, I want us to journey into the life of one of the most underrated, one of the most courageous, unsung heroes of faith in the Bible. I'm talking about a woman by the name of Hannah. Do we have any woman in the house? Any heroes in the house? Today as we observe Hannah's life and her story, I pray that God will increase your faith. That maybe God will increase your tenacity, maybe change your perspective, and perhaps more importantly, may God bring you His peace. The kind of peace that sometimes we don't understand and transcends our understanding. I pray that you'll find His peace in the midst of whatever trial that you find yourself in right now. But before we do, I want us to pray. Well, let's pray. Mighty God, I just thank you for today. Thank you for every person that is here. And I pray, Lord God, that above all, Lord God, that your word would reign in their hearts today. Pray, Lord God, that you pour out your spirit and that you would meet every person where they are at right now. In the mighty name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. You know, if you don't mind, I I want to begin by taking a moment to reflect on a few questions that have been on my mind this week. Have you ever been in a situation where you have felt slightly on edge? Perhaps a situation that made you fearful. Have you ever been put in a situation where you began to worry? maybe made the worst case scenario in your mind. If you're like me, then I'm sure that you too have experienced these feelings at some point in your life. You know, as I was preparing this message, I was reminded of the very first time I took this pulpit. Very first time I I stood here was 2009. And I had not long joined the, the youth leadership team. When this This really fine youth pastor at the time, she comes up to me. Her her name was Sarah Lacey. She comes up to me and she says, hey, 
would you mind sharing your life story at our next youth event? And I was like, uh-oh. <laughs> and you know what? I, I didn't think too much about it and I thought, well, why not? But the thing you've got to know is that when she approached me at that time, I was a complete amateur when it came to the arena of public speaking. Like, like I was, I was young-ish. I was, I was raw. I was an undisciplined student. Any undisciplined students in here? <laughs> I was from the hood in Wanganui. <laughs> Unless we forget, I was still getting used to this experience of church life. And so with this in mind, you can imagine that me speaking here for the first time was going to be a complete disaster. A complete disaster. Well, truth be told, it was indeed a total disaster. (laughs) But you know, as I reflect back on this particular event, aside from the fact that I yelled my entire sermon, made every young person cry, then they needed to come up for a prayer and they're probably scarred for life. (laughs) Uh, The one thing that I vividly remember were the emotions that went through me prior to getting up here. The heaviness, the anxiety that consumed my body and my mind. Thankfully for me, despite my anxious state and my sketchy delivery skills, God still came through for me that night. This morning I've titled this message, God's peace is greater than anxiety. God's peace is greater than anxiety. You know, it's no secret that in our society today, anxiety is on the rise. And when we examine our mental health statistics in New Zealand alone, which says that one in four New Zealanders will have some kind of anxiety disorder sometime in their life, it's crazy to think that anxiety is becoming the norm. I mean, gone are the days when when, when being anxious was just a fleeting emotion that you would feel before getting up and speaking in front of someone? Maybe bungee jumping, I don't know. Maybe before having your first kiss, I mean hug. (laughs) But today anxiety levels have gotten to the point where it is literally stopping people from doing everyday normal things. If you didn't know, Anxiety is an intense, excessive, persistent worry and fear about everyday situations. In other words, anxiety is plaguing this generation like it's a disease. Robbing people of all their God-given potential. But hey, today, I have good news for you. I have good news for you. Because God's Word says that we can do all things, right? And I believe that God wants to bring a solution to your current situation, to your current state of mind. I believe God wants to bring a hope to those of you who have struggled in the past with anxiety and for those of you who are currently going through it right now. But here's the catch. The answers don't come from a self-help manual. Those things that we're so accustomed to. It doesn't come from a better eating plan, better exercise regime. The help is found in God's Word and God's Word alone. Amen? You know, if anyone knows or understands what it means to feel immense pressure and anxiety, then it's Hannah in the Bible. You know, Hannah's name in the Hebrew language means favored and graced. Though the crazy thing here is the paradox of her name. Because Hannah's life, as you will discover as we go through this text, is that she is everything but favoured and graced. In the opening passage of Samuel verse 1, we find out that Hannah is one of two wives. Penina is the name of her rival. And they're both married to a guy called Elkanah. Now, can I just stop there for a, minute, for a minute? Because we've already come to our first problem. We see a man with two wives. A man with two wives. 
Now, although this may seem like a dreamlike scenario for a guy, one thing that is always clear in all of Scripture, whenever you look through it, is that anyone who has more than two wives, there's always drama that comes with it. Oh, but see, oh man, imagine if we could go back, you know, have those extra wives. <laughs> Trust me, one is enough, right? <laughs> one is enough. Hello. <laughs> And you see, this situation, it was no different. We have two wives, Hannah and Penina, two different personalities, two different sets of needs, two different styles of moves, moods and trauma. And possibly too many easy buy bags at the door. <laughs> of course, this love triangle was bound to have tensions. And so what were these tensions? Well, if we read in verse 2, we find out that Hannah's rival, Penina, she is blessed with children. But you know what? Hannah, she is barren. In other words, she cannot have children. Wow. Hannah, who, who, whose name means favored and graced, cannot have children. And if something tells me that Hannah probably felt emotions that were quite the opposite of feeling favoured and graced. And to add to this, she had voices that contributed to her anxiety. The first was the voice of her company. The voice of her company. Can you imagine how hard it must have been for Hannah to be in the company of a woman that had children? knowing very well that she could not give her husband children of her own. Can you imagine how, mu how mu much it must have affected her self-esteem? I mean, it's easy for the husband, right? Because he could go to one wife for affection and the other one to have children. How convenient. Her husband was so oblivious to her pain. And how do we know this? Well, on the annual visit to the temple, he notices that Hannah's face is saddened. He notices that her face is standard, but you know what? He still has the audacity to say, Hannah, why are you so downhearted? I mean, why, why are you so sad, woman? And all the while, she says nothing. Hannah had to deal with the voices in her company and the very first voice that she had to deal with was the voice of her husband. Oh babe, don't worry. You don't have to have children. You've got me. Look at me. And yet she says nothing. And then in verse six, we see another voice that adds to Hannah's anxiety. Penina. Year after year, Penina would make it her mission to provoke Hannah about not being able to have a baby. And yet Hannah would say nothing, but she would weep and she would cry. Imagine having to contest with these voices day after day after day. I mean, it's no wonder why Hannah carried so much anguish and so much pain. Amen? Amen. You know, when I was in, in high school, I had a group of friends, a good group of friends. And then over the years, we had a few other friends that would join the circle. And we had uh, this girl that joined our circle and she will remain nameless today. But I remember when she joined, she was like, she's really cool, you know? And then as I got to know her, I realized that she had a, a little bit of a different side. She'd start to make fun of me, like in a, in a banter kind of way. But then as the years would roll along, it just became nastier and nastier. And then I remember one particular situation when she, when she turned to our friends and said, hey, look at Seal's feet. Now, just as a, as a side note, there, are, there is nothing wrong with my feet, all right? <laughs> I have five, five toes on each, on each foot. But it's crazy how, how she'd begin to call me like Bigfoot, 
You know, I'm size 10, which I think is possibly the average size for a man. Should make fun of the shape. And then it got to the point where I'd begin to second guess myself. Wow, is there something wrong with my feet? And it's crazy how residue stays with you, right? Because I remember in our first year of marriage, Sarah would always say to me, babe, why do you always screw your feet together? And then I thought about it. It's because I was ashamed of them. Something from my high school years had come into my adult years. Friends, what voices in your life are causing you to feel anxious? What voices are you allowing to dictate your emotions? What voices are you allowing in your company to provoke and irritate you to the point of discouragement? I'm telling you now, you need to watch who you keep close to you. Because not everyone is going to have your back. There will be people that will say insensitive and nasty things to you, even family. There will even be people that will say things to you that may cause you to second guess yourself. Like there's something wrong with you. Why? Because that's the culture that we live in today. And this leads us to Hannah's second dilemma. The voice of her culture. Now what you've got to understand is the cultural context of that time. You see, Hannah, she lived in those days where women that didn't have children had no worth. In those days, for a woman not to have children, it was frowned upon. Because children, they meant wealth. Children meant self-sufficiency. Children meant protection and security. Children meant everything. In those days, people were expected to contribute as a collective. But if you're a woman who did not have children, you were not of any use. I mean, can we just walk in Hannah's shoes for a moment? Here's a woman who had to put up with nasty people, put up with people talking behind her back, backstabbing her, saying nasty things. Oh, how humiliating and degrading it must have been for Hannah to have lived in a pressure-driven culture. Does that sound familiar? (laughs) In today's world, our culture invokes pressures that are much the same. So many of us are trying to keep up with the trends of this world, trying to keep up with what society considers valuable. We live in a day and age where the world is trying to dictate what gives us purpose. What gives us meaning? What gives us importance and significance? We live in a day and age where the world is trying to dictate and tell us what is acceptable and beautiful. What yearly salary is considered successful. What age we should have a job. When we should own a house. When we should have kids. How much money we should have in the bank when we retire. Come on, give me a break. We unknowingly bow down to this rat race and think we're going to keep up with these cultural ideals. And then we wonder why we are weighed down with anxiety and pressures. Friends, this is what you need to understand no matter how hard you try. You're never going to meet these cultural ideals. I mean, I'm not saying it's a bad thing to have goals and to have ambitions, but if these things are adding immense pressure to your life, then you are in desperate need of a God intervention. Friends, can I encourage you, don't give in to the lie that you are lagging behind because the world's going to tell you, man, we're way ahead over here and you need to catch up. But do you know what? God says in Romans 12 verse 2, do not conform to the patterns of this world but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Church, don't let the voice of this culture determine your value and your worth. You know, when you've tried all the solutions, 
all the get well plans, all the band-aids that you put and try to conceal those wounds that you have. Sometimes you just need to trust in something that is supernatural. I'm not talking about going to any palm reader though. Sometimes we just need to move closer to God. It may sound cliche, see, I've heard this so many times, but you need to get up and you need to move closer to God. When it feels like your world is falling apart, sometimes you just got to get some fire in your belly. Get up and say enough's enough and move closer to God. Stop being reliant on yourself. Stop being reliant on other people, but get up and move closer to God. You see, this is the turning point in the story. Hannah, she takes action. Hannah comes to the end of herself as she stands up and she moves. But she moves towards prayer. Hannah moves towards prayer. But I'm not just talking about any kind of passive prayer. You know, not not those little jingles that we sing before we eat our food. (laughs) We ain't talking about a mamby-pamby, weak kind of prayer. We're talking uh, about a yearning, a deep yearning to be closer to God kind of prayer. That relentless kind of prayer that says, God, I ain't moving until I get my miracle and my breakthrough. She moved to prayer. From the depths of her soul. She says, Lord Almighty, if you would only look upon me, I am in misery. Could you remember me? Don't forget me, but give me a son. Then I will give him back to you for all the days of his life. And may no razor will ever be used on his head. Friends, when was the last time you prayed from the depth of your soul? You want to know your first course to action? You need to get down on your knees and you need to pray. You need to pray from the depth of your soul. When was the last time you cried out to God with your desire? When was the last time you prayed and pushed until something happens? See how I did that yesterday. It didn't work. We'll keep pushing until something happens. See how I prayed the the same prayer year in, year out. Well, let's gather some faith together and let's push until something happens. Prayer is a key to removing what you call anxiety. But you've got to be willing to move closer to God. Number two, the next course of action that Hannah takes leads her to receiving peace. It leads her to receiving peace. But one thing we've got to understand is that we have a, a paradigm of thinking in this world of what peace is. I see all peace is like, you know, peace. It's like we see peace from the, ans- from the absence of trouble and trials. That's the way in which we see peace. But you know, God's paradigm of thinking when it comes to peace is that You have seated rest even in the midst of your trial. That even in the midst of your misery, you know God is there. He's looking upon you. But you have quiet goodness that you are settled. But you see the world, they try and sell to us what peace is. And yet the peace efforts that this world has tried to make over the years has still ended up in war. But you know what? Jesus exhibits what it means to have peace. The peace that only He can give. The eve before He is sacrificed. 
the eve before he hears a, a thorn, a crown of thorns on his head, before he is bloodied, before the deed, before he, he knew he was going to be sacrificed, he spent his last moments with his friends. Now tell me, how do you get that kind of peace? A peace that only comes from God when you know Him. And that's the kind of peace that we need to be called to pursue. Jesus says to His disciples, peace I leave with you, peace I give to you, but not as the world understands it. Oh, come on, friends. We need to pursue the kind of peace that only God can give you. Point number three, God's provision. God's provision. You know, we read after Hannah prays. She leaves. She goes home with her husband. And then she conceives a baby. She conceives a baby, calls him Samuel. But you know, it didn't just happen immediately. There was a course of time. And you may be sitting here today thinking, man, when is my miracle and my breakthrough going to happen? Well, I'll tell you what. God always comes through on His promises. There is not one thing that goes through your mind that He doesn't know already. There is not one experience or hardship that you've gone through that God doesn't already understand. But can I encourage you this morning that even in the midst of your trial, can you keep praising Him? Even in the midst of your trials and tribulations, can you hold on to faith? Instead of running away and isolating yourself, thinking that some kind of solution is going to happen from a manual, a self-help manual, can I tell you, can you move closer to God? Because I'll tell you what, God will provide because God meets His promises. You know, as I bring this message to a close, I just want to make an appeal. I I want to take some time. And I don't know what kind of anxiety you are going through or what's behind that, whether it's family, whether it's relationships, whether it's your health issues, whether it's your finances. But can we just take a note from Hannah's story to encourage us today? Can we do that? Can we take a note from the Word that says that God is greater than all things? But you know what? It starts by knowing the voices that we currently associate with. You've got to ask yourself, is this healthy? Are these feeding me towards my potential? Are they God conversations? Is it uplifting me? And only you can answer that question. But one thing I encourage you today is that you must watch the company that you keep. Also, the culture of today moves so fast, so rapidly. Expectations are around us on the daily. Social media perpetuates this culture where we have to strive for excellence. But you know, God's just saying, just be. Just be who I created you to be. There is only one you. You are fearfully and you are wonderfully made in my image, says Christ Jesus. But then we've also got to stop self-medicating like it's something trendy to have anxiety. But we've got to say, man, I don't want to live with this any longer. 
But you know, you've got to take a course of action. And sometimes you've got to do what your natural body does not, does not want to do. It says that Hannah stood up. You cannot move if you are stationary. And sometimes we've just got to get up out of the weariness. We're going to conjure up some resilience and get up and say, man, I can't do this on my own, but I know who can. I'm going to move closer to the voice that I have avoided. The only voice that I keep avoiding, and that's God's church. We need to move closer in conversation with our God through the power of prayer. But not just any prayer. A gut-wrenching prayer. A prayer that enough's enough. God, I need you. And I need you now. I need you to move in me. I need you to renew and transform this mind to do only what you can do. And in that, I tell you, God will transfer His peace to you. Remember, not the peace that this world offers, but the peace that only comes from a higher God. If I could get you to stand with me right now. Thank you, Lord. And if I could just ask you to close your eyes right where you are. I want to make an appeal to every person in this room that has had to struggle with anxiety. I want to make an appeal to every single person in here who has been enslaved by worry and fear. And this morning, if you would be brave enough in this moment, I would love for you to raise your hand. And as you raise your hand, I'm going to pray for you this morning. Come on, God knows all. And He's speaking to you right now. Anxiety and fear and worry no more. You will not have a foothold on this generation. Mighty God, Father God, His hands are lifted and hearts are open to you this morning. Those who have, maybe have been enslaved by anxiety for so long, I pray, Lord Jesus, that, tomorrow, that this morning, Father God, that you would meet with them right now. Father God, that your spirit would begin to move as you moved in the life of Hannah. Father God, that faith would begin to rise. Hope would be seen right now, Lord Jesus. Clarity would come to minds that have been blocked out, Lord God. And I pray, Lord God, that your spirit would move. Mighty God, I thank you. Lord God, that you said that your, the work was done when you went to the cross. And I pray, Lord God, for every soul today. Father God, that as they walk out, Lord Jesus, that they would know, Father God, that being close to you is part of the remedy. Father God, may they experience a peace that transcends all understanding. And Father God, as you have done so many times in the Word, Father God, you promised to provide. Father God, not in the timing in which we see it, but Lord God, you promised that you will provide. And I pray, Lord Jesus, that our faith would rise in this moment. Lord, we thank you for what you've done in this meeting today and what you're going to continue to do in our lives. And we pray this in the name that is above every name, the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. And amen. Thank you, church.